Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss the sense of taste. Before we get down to the details, however, let's review the five senses. Simply put, we have five senses. Those are sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. In neuroscience, we like to use fancier terms. We refer to sight as vision, smell as olfaction, touch as somatosensation, taste as gustation, and hearing as audition. Let's review the senses we've just learned. Can you tell me which sense is depicted here? That's right, the sense of smell or olfaction. What about on this slide? Touch or somatic sensation is correct. And now we have one more. If you said vision or sight, you'd be right. Now let's move on to taste. Our tongue is covered in hundreds of bumps known as papillae. There are four types of papillae, but only three of them include taste buds. So we're going to concentrate on these three for now. You'll find fungiform papillae towards the front of the tongue, foliate papillae along either side, and circumvallate papillae towards the back. Each of these is covered in hundreds of taste buds. In fact, the tongue is home to over 10,000 taste buds, which are switched out approximately once every two weeks. These taste buds are in turn filled with taste cells. If you have trouble remembering which fits inside the other, just keep in mind that the bees go together. Taste buds are bigger. Taste cells, on the other hand, are small and specific. When I say specific, I mean that they're highly sensitive to only one of the five primary tastes. Taste buds, in contrast, are sensitive to all five flavors or tastes, and that is because they include all five types of taste cells. Before we move on, let's review what those five flavors or tastes are. They are sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Now let's look at an example. Let's say you go trick-or-treating and you end up with a whole bunch of warheads. You throw them all in your mouth. What happens next? Well, by doing so, you've just activated your sour taste cells. These taste cells will then send information to the gustatory cortex of the brain saying, ooh, I just tasted something really sour. We can't give your tongue all the credit though, because your nose actually plays a crucial role in your sense of taste. When you bite into something, your food releases chemicals that travel to your nose. Your olfactory receptor cells then process this information and transmit it to your brain. Don't believe me? Consider the case of a stuffy nose. When you're sick, your sense of taste is diminished. And that is because you only have taste receptor cells sending information to your brain you don't have the added benefit of your olfactory receptor cells doing the same thing. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. We are able to detect five basic tastes. Let's go ahead and look at each one of these tastes in a little bit more detail. The first taste is sweetness. This allows us to taste things like the sugar in our cookies, the honey in our tea, or the strawberries on top of our yogurt. The second taste is saltiness. This allows us to taste the salt on our potato chips or on our french fries. The third taste is bitterness. We can taste bitterness in our dark chocolate bars, in our freshly brewed coffee, or in the spinach in our salads. 
The fourth taste is sourness. We can taste this sourness in foods like citruses, vinegars in our sauces and dressings, or other fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, and kombucha tea. The last taste is something known as umami. Umami describes our ability to taste a specific molecule that is called glutamate. Foods that have a strong umami flavor include things like gravies, fish, tomatoes, mushrooms, and soy sauce. If you've ever looked at your tongue in the mirror, you'll notice a dozen of tiny little bumps scattered all over your tongue. In each of these bumps, we have something that is called a taste bud. The taste bud is this part of our tongue that allows us to taste these five different flavors. We have three different types of taste buds, so let's go ahead and look at what each of these taste buds is like. The first type of taste bud is called a fungiform taste bud. This type is slightly mushroom shaped, and they are found more in the front sections of the tongue. The second type of taste bud is called a foliate taste bud. This type has more ridges and grooves, and they are found more along the sides of the tongue. The third type of taste bud is called a circumvallate taste bud. This type is a lot more dome shaped, and they are found along the back of the tongue and are arranged in a semicircular row. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at the structure of an individual taste bud. There is a small opening in the taste bud that is called the taste pore. When you go inside the taste bud, it is filled with many smaller cells called taste cells. Each of these taste cells is responsible for detecting one of the five different tastes, which is represented by the different colors. For example, the cell that is outlined in green might be one that's responsible for sweet tastes. So each entire taste bud will have all of these different types of taste cells. Each bud will then be able to detect bitter, salty, sweet, sour, and umami flavors. So no matter where on the tongue you look, you'll be able to detect all five of these different tastes. Now that we've covered the taste buds and transmission of taste information, let's try a cool application of the knowledge we've just learned. As we just learned, taste buds contain taste receptors, Spiciness is sensed when capsaicin molecules bind to particular receptors called TRPV1. TRPV1 receptors are present throughout the body, which is why it hurts to get chili pepper residue in your eyes, but the molecule crosses mucous membranes very well. Capsaicin does not actually cause a chemical burn or indeed any direct tissue damage at all when chili peppers are the source of exposure. The inflammation resulting from exposure to capsaicin is believed to be the result of the body's reaction to nerve excitement. So an experiment on capsaicin shouldn't cause any physical damage and thus would be relatively safe. So, to lead into the experiment, let me ask you a question. When you eat something super spicy, how can you make the burning sensation go away? Luckily, these two guys has tried it out for us. All right, here we go. Yeah. Woo! I'm gonna get a hiccup, big time. <laughs> oh gosh, I forgot how much I ate this. Why was this the idea for the season? <laughs> <laughs> Don't vomit, like. So after seeing how miserable they are, if we could choose from the following food to ease their pain from capsaicin, which one or which ones would you choose? Would it be water, ice, juice, coconut milk, vegetable oil, chips? peanut butter, or milk. You could pause the video to make your choice. Take your time. Once you've made up your mind, let's see how some of these food actually work. Real bad. Oh, it's really in my back of my throat is hurting real bad. Right back there. Like, whoa, this is helping me. Hmm. 
Right, there's relief. Instant relief. Mm. Then it goes away. Well, you could try out coconut milk, vegetable oil, or chips on your own. Um, but peanut butter is a representative example, and milk is too. So, the result we have is that peanut butter and milk both work. And I'm just going to directly tell you the result. The coconut milk and vegetable oil and chips and peanut butter all work. And as you can see, milk works really well. So why is that? To explain this, let's look at the solubility of capsaicin. Pure capsaicin is hydrophobic or lipophilic, which means it is fat soluble. Peanut butter, coconut milk, vegetable oil, and chips work pretty well because there's a great deal of fat, and capsaicin is fat soluble. The fat dissolves the capsaicin and takes it away from the receptors on our tongue. For milk, it's a similar case. But it works even better because it contains casein proteins that surround capsaicin so that it cannot bind to taste receptors. Casein is a lipophilic, or literally fat-loving protein, which means that it acts as a detergent on capsaicin. Note that casein is present in animal milk, but not in vegetable milk. You could try out this experiment at home if you're interested in verifying the result. Since we've learned all about TRPV1 receptors and spiciness, here's a fun fact about it. Birds might not understand what spiciness is. In birds, the TRPV1 receptor does not respond to capsaicin. This might be because capsaicin only selectively discourages vertebrates predators without deterring more effective seed depressors. In other words, the reason why peppers do not attack birds might be that birds could help spread their seeds.